Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Janelle Olitz. I am going to I'm pitch hitting for Cheryl and Barry today, and I'm going to talk to you about pears. Um, uh, certainly one of my favorite fruits. They are ripening up this time of year. So pear is related to apple. It's kind of a cousin. It's a member actually of the rosaceae family, and that's essentially just a, a large grouping that kind of figures out what um, what's genetics are, are close related. And roses are actually also closely related to apples and pears and many of the other fruits um, in the rosaceae family. The Latin name for pear is Pyrus cuminus, and they originated from kind of the western region of China, and then a little bit. Um, farther east into Asia Minor. So they like a temperate region, which is kind of the, the region that's slightly north of here, but they do grow in North Carolina really well. Um, and generally, in, in they kind of traveled from Asia, they were domesticated. And essentially what that means is that people could grow them in their backyards, continuously breeding them that way. And then they kind of came across the ocean, with the English and the French settlers and ended up in the United States. And here in the United States, we actually ended up doing a lot of planting of the pears from seed. And so our pears that grow in the United States and the, um, the pear varieties actually kind of diverged from what is most common in Europe. So pears can live um, rather long lives if they are well taken care of and healthy and they live about 70, um, 50 to 75 years. And they get very large if they are not grafted onto a rootstock that would keep them a little bit smaller. Um, and also maybe rootstocks, um, grafted pear varieties that you would grow in your home would maybe give them slightly a bit more of um, resistance to some of the soil borne diseases. So, they have been around, cultivated for over 3,000 years. So pears have a very, very long history in, um, in some of our, you know, if you see cave paintings or not necessarily cave paintings, but paintings that were done by you know, 3,000 years ago and there's actually a pear there. So this is kind of really interesting. Something when I was doing the research for this um, was quite surprising to me. So if you wanna grow pears in your backyard, uh, they like a very, well-drained soil, you want to stick it in somewhere where it's going to be waterlogged, but they can actually take some of the heavier clay soils, which we tend to have around this region of the Piedmont in North Carolina. And they generally like similar conditions to apples, and that's a pH of the soil between six um, and seven. And of course they like full sun, uh, that will help them to get the most amount of fruit. And they need more than one variety, similar to apples, to be pollinated. So if you wanted to grow pears, you can't grow one pear unless you have a neighbor that's near you. That, um, in that case, then maybe the bees go over to that pear, they visit your pear, and they help to cross-pollinate. So if you're lucky enough to live near someone else who has some other varieties, you could get away with growing one. But if you wanted to put one in your yard and be guaranteed that you're going to get some fruit, generally you want one, another type within the vicinity. So we have, there's a lot of different types of pear and I have some here. This particular pear, very nice, kind of green on one side and red on the other. Likely it probably gets red because this is, the sun was shining on this. This is a Pharrell pear. This one looks similar, but has a little bit of a different shape of that. That is called a red Bartlett pear. Then we have the Bosque pear. A lot of people might be familiar with this, kind of has this kind of uh, more rough skin to it, um, but very tasty. And then one that maybe you are not all familiar with, but it is related to the pear, and that is the Asian pear um, here, which is also known as a sand apple. Um, interesting to know. Has a slightly different flavor, but still has a crunch. I'd have to say it's a little bit more juicy, but crunchy at the same time than a regular pear, but very, very tasty. And those generally tend to grow um, in, um, they have both the Chinese and Japanese varieties. And then we have the Concord pear. And very similarly shaped, this is the conference pear. Um, and these are very much uh, US varieties. And then some very typical ones you see in the grocery store is the Danju pear which is nice and short and squat. This one actually is the one that I am going to show you to cook in a little bit. 
And then this particular one is the commas pair. Looks a lot like it, but it's slightly different shaped. Kind of has an indent on the bottom um, and a little bit more indent on the top, but they're all delicious. So pears, when you first pick them, actually, they do not necessarily ripen on the tree. If you're gr growing a pear and you're waiting for them to get nice and soft and squishy, like say a peach, that would not happen. So you actually, they ripen after you pick them. It generally takes about a week. Um, so when you get them in the store and they're really hard, all you need to do is kind of maybe stick them in a bag with an apple, that might help. The apples actually release something called ethylene um, and that helps to ripen the fruit. And fruit naturally have ethylene as they start to ripen, they um, begin to release that, um, it's a, just a plant hormone that signals to the plant, oh, it's time to get nice and juicy so I can get eaten. Um, and so generally um, you wanna wait around if your pears are hard for maybe five to six, seven days out at room temperature, they will ripen up. But if you wanna keep them, so you say you got this great sale on pears and they're really nice and hard, you keep them in the refrigerator, kind of in the back so it stays cool, they will last for a while and then you just take them out as you uh, want to eat them and they will ripen up when they come to room temperature. So I want to show you um, a video that I took of the other day um, to, of me making a pear salad, one of my favorite ways to cook pears. So here we go, share this, hopefully it will, there we go, hopefully it'll work. Arugula with blue cheese. Um, I have some craisins in here and uh, some almonds. I'm going to also have a balsamic vinaigrette dressing. How to cut a, the pear. So, first, you just cut it in half. And then you take those halves, each of those halves, and cut them in half again. Then, to get the core out, you want to come in at an angle. And get the core out of there. Then once the core is out, a fairly stable surface, and you cut each of these into thirds. That's a very good question. This pair is a Danjou pair. But there's many different kinds of pears. The key with the type of pear that you're cooking is to make sure it's hard. So if you cook a soft pear, it's gonna, it's gonna kind of disintegrate in the pan. So you really wanna make sure that you are choosing the hardest pears you can. So that is one nice thing about cooking with pears is you can cook them with them when they're hard. Whereas when you eat them, you wanna eat them when they're really soft because um, they have the best flavor. But for this, because we're gonna caramelize them, you want them nice, nice and solid. So in this bowl right here, I'm gonna prepare uh, for my pears to caramelize because I need about a tablespoon and a half of sugar. Then I also need a pinch of salt or so. We'll say about half a teaspoon to three quarters of a teaspoon of salt and then some fresh ground pepper. But if you don't have fresh ground pepper, just use some regular pepper. I like mine to be pretty spicy, but this is kind of a, uh, you can just however you want to do it, a little bit or a lot, depending on what you want. Let me kind of toss that around a little bit, put the pear slices in there. This is the fun part. I get to toss them up and down. And I'm all coated with the sugar, salt, and pepper mixture. So that they have sugar coating all sides of them. Then we're going to come over to the stuff. Pear tongs. It's the best thing to do this with. Okay. Now you see that the water is dancing around in my pan, it's evaporating. So now I can put in my butter. I use about a tablespoon of butter. And I also like to put in a little bit of olive oil as well because that helps keep the butter from burning. So now that the pan is heated up and it's the butter splashing all over the place. Um, I'm going to place these pear slices in. Now you can see that around the edge, we're getting some nice kind of brown color that's showing me that the sugars are really starting to caramelize. And so now we're going to take a peek and see what these pears look like on the other side. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. So right there, you can see that's really nice and, and caramelized color. That's the color I want. So now I'm going to flip the remaining pairs over. And so this second side will actually take a lot less time to get some color on the pair slice. So um, really don't have to uh, take too long. Maybe you take about a minute and then these will be ready to come off of here. So we're ready to take them off and then I'm going to place them onto the stop the, the stop. So this is where we make it look all nice and pretty. Yeah. Place the pairs here on the salad. There's a big cooperate. So now I'm going to Deglaze this pan, which is essentially just trying to get all this yummy goodness off. I don't need to turn the pan back on. There's enough residual heat in this pan that I've got a balsamic vinaigrette dressing here that I've made. I'm just going to pop it right in here. Stir it around. And try to scrape up all the yumminess and the caramelization off the bottom of the pan. I just love balsamic vinegar and it smells so good in here right now. All right. Too bad we didn't have smell of it. So now we're just going to take the mist and drizzle this over the salad. Bon appetit. Um. The last thing we have, we're going to talk about one other thing, and these are uh, hot peppers, which I don't know if you can see them. You might be able to see them in there. They're really kind of cute and pretty, and a purple color. These are a, now I'm drawing a blank of what they are. It's like Figola Roxa, something like that. I will get the information. I totally blanked on what it is. It's a hot pepper. And it says it's on a Scoville of only 10,000 to say 15,000, 20,000. Um, it does, I think it's way harder than that. Cause I popped one of these in my mouth and ate it the other day and it, it was hot, but uh, I dried them. And then I used them the other day and I dried them in a food hydrator and I um, then, pulverized them once I get really crispy and dry. I uh, made a chili powder kind of out of it and put it in a chili and actually they were not bad. They were super hot. So um, perhaps don't eat the seeds like I did and that might also help um, as well. And they are um, come from the region of Brazil. That's where they, they come from. And they would grow similar to all other hot peppers liking warm conditions um, in the summertime. And then uh, peppers are really kind of neat because they can grow for a very long time. And if you have a sunny window, you might get away with bringing one inside your house and, and they would continue to produce if you had a lot of sun or if you have a greenhouse. Um, they'll just slow down as the daylight gets less. And they also like conditions similar to any other pepper plant in the soil, well-drained soil that has a pH um, higher than 5.5, generally closer to 6 uh, to 6.5. Um, and they produce really a, a, a lot. So if you like hot peppers and you want to make hot pepper jelly, I would definitely go with these hot peppers because um, they're spicy and uh, they certainly produce a lot. So now I, I know that there is question and answer time. So Krista, how do I do that? Awesome. Thanks so much, Janelle, for all those great tips for us. Um, so if you have a question, I see someone already knows this because they've already asked a question, but there are three ways that you can ask your question. So you can go to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A button down there and um, type in your, your question and then press send and we'll receive it. You can also do that in the chat. Um, there's another box that says chat. You can type it, something in there. And um, I see some people have already done that as well. And we can answer it there. If you're in Facebook Live, please just send your question through a, a comment there and Carmen will get it to us. 
And finally, the thing I like the most is if you raise your hand. So if you click on the participant thing at the bottom um, and then you go to your right and there's a little um, menu that pops up and you click on that, you can raise your hand and then I will call on you and you will get to say your question out loud. We would love that if you do that. So let's start with the first question. Um, we have one that I think you already saw there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit it back with you, Janelle. The first one is, I have a pear tree, but what can I do to identify what kind of pear tree I have? How long could I leave the pears on the tree after the tree starts producing? So um, how to know what type of pear you have is generally to look at the fruit once they've gotten to full size. Um, that is probably the best way to tell is to just to look, kind of look at the fruit, fruit and compare it to uh, maybe a photo online of what that pear looks like when it's fully grown. Um, and perhaps uh, there is some, um, there's a specialist at NC State who is the um, kind of the tree fruit specialist. He may be able to also identify the pear, but it would need to be generally kind of the, the pear being full grown and getting the fruit because almost all pears look very similar until you see what the, the fruit looks like. Um, that's probably the best suggestion. Now, as far as when they get ripe, generally knowing the variety helps is that you wanna know kind of when they blossomed and then know how long it takes to maturity. And that is something I should have looked up and did not know the length of time it takes for the fruit to get to maturity because there are a certain number of days um, after the, the fruits are set. So that means that the flower is pollinated that you'd know, okay, say it's like uh, 60 days or 70 days until, and then at that point you can pick the fruit. In general, once they look like they're full size, they are ready to be picked. Leaving them on for longer, like say they're not looking like they're getting any bigger, that's when you wanna pick them because in general, they're not gonna get more ripe and they will start to actually disintegrate and then become less, less good over time if you leave them on. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Yes. So our next question um, is kind of a similar question, but I think it's the, it's the other side once you're shopping, when you're grocery shopping. Um, so how do you, when you get, and I have, I think you kind of explained a little bit this, but when you pick something at the grocery store and you get it home and it's not ripe, how can you pick the best pair at the grocery store? <laughs> so you get the, the best pair. And um, and then I think if you could explain again how to ripen the pear, I think that would be helpful because okay. um, sure. that's interesting information. So this pear, pretty hard. You can you can just tell when you kind of hold it, it, it and you push on it a little bit, it's it's pretty dense. So it's, it's hard and this one probably will be ready to eat um, at room temperature in four to five days, it'll start to get ripe. Um, and, this one here is a little bit softer. You can press on the bottom um, is where I would suggest either pressing there or up at this top. Generally in the area, you're not really gonna want to eat. They can bruise really easily. So what you don't wanna do is if you squish in the middle here, you're gonna add a, add a bruise as it ripens. And so it'll go um, get bad faster. So by pressing on the bottom, this one I can feel is, is, is a little softer. This one would be ready to eat um, depending. If you like a crunchy pear, and actually I do, um, I would eat this now, but um, also you could wait a couple more days. Generally, when they start to smell like a pear, they are definitely ready to eat. Um, so at the most, it's gonna take a week to ripen. You can ripen them outside on a counter, um, you know, in a fruit bowl or wherever you like to set your fruit. Um, in, in generally, if it's comfortable for you, it's comfortable for the pear to ripen. But if you wanna ripen them a little faster, apples, which is why they say don't put apples next to bananas, because uh, apples produce a lot of ethylene and that would make those bananas go brown really fast. Well, if you want to ripen something by keeping them near the, um, the, the apples and the pears together, the ethylene being emitted from the apple will actually help ripen the pears. And if you wanted to go even faster and trap that gas in there that the ethylene is um, producing, put the pears with the apples in a brown paper bag, or something like that, not a oh, plastic bag because then they would start to rot because it's it's too moist. Um, but put them in a brown paper bag or even in a box like this, something like that. Um, we keep them together and they'll check them every day and pull them out when they're good and tasty. 
As far as picking one in the store, try to get one that doesn't have blemishes. Um, but you know, if, it depends on what you're gonna do with it. If you're gonna make jam or you're gonna cook with it, it's okay to have a blemish because you're gonna cook with it anyway. Um, so don't just discard something just because it's not a beautiful thing. We want to love those ones that aren't so beautiful either. Um, but if you're trying to impress your friends and have a beautiful fruit bowl or a cornucopia for your Thanksgiving table, you would probably want one that looked nice and pretty. And, you know, this one's kind of got scratches and stuff on it. Still edible. This one's kind of more visually appealing. So it depends on what you want to do with them. Um, but my suggestion is unless you're ready to eat the pears right away or cook with them right away, uh, making a jam or something, if they are really soft in the store, uh, you only have a day or two before you really have to eat them. Great. I hope that um, so our next question is about the kinds of pears that we could grow here in North Carolina. Of all the many varieties that you, you talked about, which would you suggest um, would be the most healthy here in North Carolina? Well, the, there's a, a lovely list um, on our Cooperative Extension site. So um, you could Google pear trees and NCSU, and they will come up with a list of the best pear trees. But I do know the Seckle pear grows really well here, as well as I believe the Concord does. Um, you can also do, um, I think the, um, the Bartlett as well. But the biggest thing isn't necessarily the variety. It actually has to do with what it is grafted onto. Um, so what type of rootstock it's grafted onto, as well as looking for varieties that are fire blight resistant. That is the biggest key for a type of pear tree is to make sure, regardless of whether it's an Asian pear or a regular European pear, is to make sure that they have resistance to fire blight. Um, and so finding one from a reputable source, not necessarily buying it at the local DIY when they have pear trees for sale, but going to a nursery that does sell and specialize in fruit trees, um, or you can order them. There are multiple places online and, and do a little research and looking for um, someone that's knowledgeable that can look at, you know, rootstocks that are, are, are vigorous, that um, also help to keep the tree dwarfed. So that's a little bit shorter. It's a lot easier to pick a tree that you can reach the fruit on instead of having to get up on a 20 foot ladder because your, your tree grew to 45 feet tall. Um, so that's, those are also things to, to pick. Um, but in general, most varieties of pear will grow here, but know that if you have a slope in your yard, you wanna put it at the top of the slope, not at the bottom of the slope. Cold air actually drops. And so when we do get a cold spell, um, you want to, by having that tree up higher, it would get exposed to less cold air than, than being on the bottom of the slope. Um, and also a southern facing slope also is good because it's getting this, the sunlight um, as well. Great, thank you, that's, that's great. Um, I'm going to tempt our seeds kids to, to speak up this week. Do any of you have a question before we close? Raise your hand and I will call on you or put it in the chat that you'd like to talk. No I takers. I know one of, one of these days I'm going to get them to answer. I think um, I, I told Sherilyn last week it was going to be chocolate, I think. So um, mm. I think then that we are out of questions and out of time. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Janelle, for coming and, and showing us this wonderful recipe. Um, I am feeling a little hungry right after lunch. So I think that's a good sign that you did a great job. <laughs> so, <laughs> And thanks, everyone, for coming. We'll see you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We may have a question. Oh, just some lovely thank yous. Thank you to y'all, too. Thank you. Enjoy the pears, these kids. Bye-bye. <laughs>